standing, we will read and hear our gospel lesson for this morning, which comes to us from the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. If you'd like to follow along, you can find this in your pew Bible on New Testament, page 57, Luke 4, 1 through 13. And here's what it says. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may see. Once upon a time there was a painter. And one day he made a deal to paint a woman's house for a thousand dollars. But when he got started, he realized how much time and effort it was going to take to complete the house, and so he decided that he needed to do something to increase his profit on the And so, since the woman didn't really keep an eye on him when he painted, he began to mix the paint with thinner. After all, paint is expensive. And by adding in thinner, he would be able to make a can of paint go farther, thus lowering his costs and increasing his gain. As he tabulated his earnings and the amount of money he was saving, he kept adding in more and more thinner. By the time the house was finished, he was quite proud of himself. He had turned a tidy little profit, and the woman would never know what he had done. Then, just as he was preparing to clean up, put his ladders away, it started to rain, a torrential down. And as the waters fell, the paint, all that thinner in it, began to run, washing right off the woman's house. The man stood there in slack-jawed disbelief of what he was seeing. And just then, the rain stopped. Clouds parted. And the sun came out. And a booming voice from on high was heard to say, Repaint and thin no more. <laughs> Last Wednesday marked the beginning of Lent, a roughly 40 day season hearkening to Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness which is meant to be one of deep and careful introspection, of deliberate spiritual preparation for the pinnacle of the Christian year, which is Easter. And we know about Lent, don't we? It's, it's typically a season of, of somber tones given to reminders of our mortality, reminders of our dependence upon God, marked by signs and, and symbols like dust and, and thorns and hues of purple. It's a season wherein we are called to repent and sin no more. Similar to the messages we heard 
during Advent, we are beckoned during these 40 days to call on the name of the Lord and, and to be saved. An invitation, according to our reading from Romans, that's open to all and, and without distinction. But what we sometimes miss is what's meant by that. What we sometimes miss is it's what, what, what it means to be saved. Because the Greek root is the term sozo, meaning to keep safe, meaning to rescue. But it also carries connotations of being healed, connotations of, of being made well, connotations of being made whole. And so to be saved goes beyond something that we usually relegate only to the hereafter. It's a call to be cleansed. It's it's a call to be renewed. It's a call to be remade now. It's a call to be changed and because we have been changed, because we are being changed, to live accordingly. To live as changed people. To put it in very Wesleyan terms, salvation is a call to holiness of heart and life as a response to God's will. And this is part of why we hear so much during the Lenten season about, about sin and, and turning from it, because sin obstructs us from holiness. But part of the problem, I think, is identifying the sin. What is it, really? Now, I've heard sin defined as is violating God's commands. You've probably heard it put that way too. I've also heard sin defined as missing the mark, which is actually a very literal interpretation of the word used in Scripture. But from where I stand, I find that sin is this. Sin is loving too much that which isn't God. Among the many other nuances that one might add, among the many other things that one might say, at its core and at its most basic sense, sin is loving too much that which isn't God. Now, note that I didn't say that sin is loving that which isn't God. We, we can certainly love persons and, and things which aren't God. God even tells us to love persons which aren't God. We are, we are commanded by Christ to love other people, to love our neighbor, but also to love our enemy. Remember me saying that just a couple of weeks back? Not long ago, we heard St. Paul remind the Corinthian church and remind us how important love is, and the love that he describes in his teaching is love that's aimed at others. It's an affection toward those around us that mirrors the affection that we experience in God, that we receive from God. And so sin is not loving that which isn't God. Sin is loving too much that which isn't God. It begins with our assigning or our ascribing worth, which should be given to God, to something or to someone else. Now, here's the question of the day. As creaturely beings, <coughs> what do we tend to love the most? As creaturely beings, who do we tend to? To love the most. What do we typically love above all else? Is anyone feeling brave enough to respond? Because the answer, of course, is me. Above all else, we typically tend to love ourselves most of all. I usually take care of me. things for me. I rarely deprive me. Oh, I sometimes get angry with me. 
frustrated with me, disappointed even with me, but at the end of the day, I am still relatively quick to love me, quicker than I am to love most others. <clears throat> and the fact is, even the love of our possessions, even the love of our stuff, it emanates from an excess of self-love, because that's my stuff that belongs to me. That's mine. Therefore, if sin is loving too much that which isn't God, and what we tend to love most is ourselves, it follows that the underlying cause of sin is selfishness. Satiating our own desires, satisfying our own hungers. And isn't this exactly what the accuser threw at Jesus? When Jesus was led, literally, when he was brought into the wilderness by the Spirit, we're told that Jesus was tempted by the devil. Now, St. Matthew's version of the story is somewhat less impactful because it reads as if Jesus fasted for 40 days and then he was beset by temptation. And that would have been bad enough. But here in St. Luke's account, we read that Jesus was tempted for the entirety of the 40 days. The whole of the 40 days. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Daily, Jesus endured the internal whispering. Daily, he felt the gnawing and the discontent within. Daily, he wondered if he had gotten it wrong or, or if there was another way. Daily, he wrestled with uncertainty if you are the Son of God. And each temptation that the devil offered was aimed at Jesus' own fulfillment. Each one was an attempt to cause Jesus to focus on himself. And I have to say, it would have been easy for him to do so. I've always found a bit of humor in this narrative. Because the evangelist writes, he ate nothing at all for 40 days, and when they were over, he was famished. And really, you think so? I mean, after 40 days in the desert, who wouldn't have been hungry? Who wouldn't feel weak? Who wouldn't feel vulnerable? And the thing is, knowing this, the enemy seizes upon Jesus' humanness, offering him food and, and offering him prestige and, and offering him security. And Jesus turns each one of them down, saying that each, in its own way, distorts or, or, or contradicts or gets wrong God's will. Now, I have to say that on the surface, none of that which Jesus has offered seems inherently wicked. I mean, he's in a state of near starvation and he's offered bread. Is that really so bad? Don't we all require physical sustenance? He's also offered a place of control and the promise of safety. Two more things which human beings tend to strive for, but but given what he had endured, could we really blame him? I mean, as, as a human being, could we really blame him if he had accepted? So then the question is, why does he perceive these things as opposing the divine purpose? Why does he turn them away to sin? And I think it's because each was an attempt to take Jesus' primary attention off of him. Because each was an attempt to get Jesus to place his attention instead on himself in disproportionate ways. And we see this as we read closely Jesus' responses. Because with each temptation, as the devil tries to persuade Jesus to, to do something or to take something for himself, Jesus points where? Jesus points back toward God. One does not live by bread alone, but, as Matthew says, on God's word. Worship and serve only God. Don't put God to the test. And notice, friends, hear this. Jesus does not deny that he's hungry. He doesn't say that he isn't. He doesn't say that the place of prominence that he's offered sounds bad. He doesn't disagree 
that shelter from harm would be nice. He simply says that God comes first. Even though there were things he needed, maybe even wanted, God comes first. And so the message that we receive from Jesus on this day is that to put anything or anyone else in God's spot is sin. Few days ago, we had midday and evening gatherings here to observe the beginning of Lent, Ash Wednesday. Anybody remember? Prayers were offered, recognizing God's creative and redemptive work. Scriptures were read, which called us to humility and obedience and repentance. And, and as we came forward in silence, a mixture of of palm ashes and, and olive oil was smudged onto our foreheads in the shape of a cross, reminding us of our finite existence, reminding us of our need for a Savior, reminding us how the cross images us, images for us a new sense of identity and belonging. What some of you don't know is that it was my very first Ash Wednesday where I didn't have to impose the cross on myself. Serving alongside of Andy and Bernardo, we were able to offer the mark to one another, and so, as we left, the crosses looked pretty decent. The same cannot be said of my very first Ash Wednesday as a pastor about 13 years ago. Now the service, as it always is for me, was quite special. But when I arrived home, I stepped into the restroom and caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror. And in so doing, I noticed that my cross wasn't much of a cross at all. It kind of looked like an ink cartridge explode. <laughs> in part because I've been sweating a bit, in part because I tend to furrow my brow like a lot. But the largest contributing factor was that I had applied all those years ago the ashes to myself blindly, basically hoping for the best, and it didn't go. But isn't that what's true? Think about that on a deeper sense. <coughs> isn't that what's true? As we come to Christ, we are marked as His own, marked as it were, with and by the cross. And the apostle says that we are made new in Christ, made new to the point that it should be him who people see when they look at us. Our lives should embody that which the cross makes present, forgiveness and reconciliation and healing and self-denying love. But too often that cross too often that image of Christ which we are to show forth becomes distorted. And too often it's because I have tried to do too much myself. It's because I have tried to be in control. Because I have been too concerned about me. And I wonder how many of us recognize this in ourselves. I wonder how many of us wittingly or unwittingly have let that cross fade. I wonder how many of us wittingly or unwittingly have allowed that cross to become distorted. I wonder how many of us can admit that we have too frequently put our own way first. Or that we too frequently allow that which isn't God to take God's place in our hearts. But here the good news of Lent <coughs> is that even if we have been there and even if we are there it doesn't end there and we needn't stay there in fact I find that the words of the hymn we sang earlier resonate very deeply in this way hear them again as they say, Lord, who throughout these 40 days for us didst fast and pray, 
Teach us with thee to mourn our sins and close by thee to stay. As thou with Satan didst contend and didst the victory win, O oh, give us strength in thee to fight, in thee to conquer sin. As thou didst hunger, bear, and thirst, so teach us, gracious Lord, to die to self and chiefly live by thy most holy name. Abide with us, that so this life of suffering overpass an Easter of unending joy. We may attain at last. Dear ones, may we ponder these words. And may they be our guiding prayer that we might find the newness that we seek, the newness that we need <coughs> throughout these 40 days. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.